don't forget. Um, and it looks like people are starting to join us. So I'll start admitting them. Sounds like a plan. Here they come. I see some familiar names, which is nice. Um, <laughs> like one of the most exciting parts of my job, right? Is getting to see yeah. people arrive. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're just gonna wait a few minutes for everybody to load into the session um, and get connected and comfortable and all that good stuff. Slowly letting everybody in. We'll wait just a few minutes before we get started. I see some familiar faces in the session. Glad you're here. Thank you for spending a, a little bit of time on a Friday with us. Or maybe even Saturday morning, depending on where you are in the world. I know there are folks joining us from all over today, so we're very grateful. All right. Seems like things have slowed down a little bit. Maybe I'll give it another second or so before I really launch into my speech here. All right, that's it, that's that second. I'm gonna go ahead and get started and some, some people will keep joining us. Um, so hello everybody, once again, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Duncan King, I'm one of the admission counselors here at Reed. I'm gonna be hosting a little bit today. Um, and so I will introduce our presenters in just a moment, but there's one important detail. Um, as we're going today, you guys might have questions, and the most efficient way to ask questions is for you all to direct chat them. And if you haven't used Zoom, if you haven't had the pleasure of using Zoom yet, the chat is at the bottom of your screen, right in the middle. Um, and then you can click on my name and direct chat your questions to me, and then I will sort of group them together if they're similar, or um, I might, if it's really, really simple, then I might answer it myself in the chat, but I bet most of them I will push on up to our presenters um, just so everyone can hear the question and all that good stuff. So again, direct chat your questions to me, but uh, with that, I will hand it over to our first presenter, Jason, and the rest of the team in the registrar's office. Great, thanks, Duncan. Um, John, you can probably go ahead and start presenting, I think, if you want to put that up. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jason Marr. I am the uh, incoming registrar at, uh, at Reed. Uh, for those of you that, that attended the uh, session on Monday, uh, you would know that this is the end of my second week at Reed. So uh, you and I are getting this information together. Uh, this information is as new to me as it is to you, so uh, just hang in there. We are recording this session, so if you or I need to go back and reference this, we can we can do that. Um, go ahead and next slide, John. Yeah, and just a, a brief moment to say we are so happy that you are coming to read. Um, we recognize that uh, your high school experience was was significantly disrupted by the pandemic and and likewise life at Reed uh, significantly disrupted, but um, we're just very excited to be welcoming this this incoming class to to a life together that's maybe a, a little bit more regular so uh, very happy to have you. Uh, you can go next slide john. There we go. And uh, we've got some folks from the registrar's office that are going to be uh, walking you through uh, the mechanics of registration, the real nuts and bolts of this. Uh, we've got Norm McLaughlin, who is uh, the current registrar at Reed, who I've been overlapping with a little bit, uh, luckily. And uh, our associate registrars, John Colgrove and uh, Martha Schlitt. And they'll, they'll introduce themselves a little bit as we go along. Uh, these folks are going to be talking today about um, how you uh, plan for your first uh, advising appointment, um, a little bit about the Reed curriculum, 
uh, including uh, PE classes and why those are important, um, how you are going to plan your class schedule, uh, some registration strategies, and then just plan how you get registered for classes at Reed. Um, so with that, I think I'll just hand it off to Nora. Hi, everyone. So glad you're here. I echo Jason's welcome. We're, we're looking forward to seeing you in the fall. So um, some of this will be a little bit of a repeat from things we said on Monday, but very briefly. Um, this summer, we're going to have registration in early July, and you're going to have the benefit of two advisors. We're going to have a, a summer core of advisors, um, senior members of the faculty who've been around a long time and will be advising a number of students to help select their, their first year courses. So that will happen in late June. Um, advisors will reach out to you and you will know who your summer advisor is and meet with them to, to talk about what a good set of classes for fall and spring would be. Um, then in, in the fall, when you get to read your academic advisor, so that's the person that you will be working with over the year, and sometimes over all four years, we'll meet with you just to make sure you've got the right classes, if you're on wait lists to tell you what to do about that and that kind of thing. So, and that gives you a, a, a little bit of time right before classes begin to, to fine tune anything that you're concerned about with your schedule or to get any questions asked. So um, you may notice when you find out who your summer advisor is and even your academic advisor, that they may not be in the, the major department that you said you might be pursuing. Um, those of you who are undecided, that's great. We have advisors who are really good at advising people across different choices. So if the advisor isn't in your major, not to worry. Um, the curriculum is pretty straightforward. We give advisors resources about how to advise across the curriculum. And many of our first year students are really exploring two or three different majors at a time when they first get here. And there are ways to do that in the read curriculum. So not to worry um, if, you're, if your advisor isn't in the major that, that you're um, planning. And what if you don't know what you want your major to be? As I said before, not a problem. We have um, many of our students come as undecided and then Many of our students who think they know what they're going to pursue end up getting here and finding something totally different and, and pursue that path. So a lot of choices for you. Go ahead, John. So um, before your summer advising appointment, so again, that'll be toward the end of June, um, review the schedule of classes online. That is something you can see now, you can look at, and we update that with any changes. You know, um, check the catalog description of classes that look interesting to you. Um, one of the things to look for is something called a prerequisite, and a prerequisite is something that's required before you get into a course. So, for example, second year French, you would either have to have taken first year French or placed into into second year French. So check for prerequisites. Um, there are some courses that aren't available to first year students, um, but many are. So um, having a look at that will, will get a, give you a better sense of, of what's, what's truly available. And then if you're thinking of different kinds of majors, we have something called major planners, just one page summaries of, of what that major, what a major in that, in that field would look like. Go ahead, John, next slide. One of the things to think about is um, which PE classes sound fun. Um, for those of you who aren't big fans of PE, and we always have a number of students who are like, why do I have to take PE? Um, you know, have a look at those. Um, there are lots of choices for you. So when you're thinking about academic classes, PE is off to the side of that, but, but it is a requirement. So it's something to pay attention to. Sketch out sample schedules. Um, John and Martha will talk about this a little bit, but, but see how the week looks. I think in high school, the choices, you were pretty much in class from when you got there to when you finished. And, and when you come to read, you're gonna have holes in your, in your day for studying, going to library, um, hanging out with friends, that kind of thing. So sketch out some sample schedules, see what it might feel like um, when, you get, when you look at the courses. And then make a list of questions. Um, that you have about courses and registration. I mean, you can certainly send us questions, but things that you might want to talk to your advisor about, your summer advisor. 
Next slide, John. So I would say for your advising appointment, what should you have in hand? This advising appointment will be like this over Zoom. So have a list of classes in which you're interested. So humanities, all the first year students take, humanities 110, plus two other courses each in fall and spring. We do register for the full year, so you have a sense of the year. You can certainly change the spring classes as you, as you move into fall and maybe find something that is of greater interest. Think about second and third choice classes. You may not get your first choice class. Um, we're a small college, which is very cool because you get to know your faculty, you get to know your other students, um, but not everybody fits into every class. So have some choices. Because we'll be doing advising and registering before most of, of the AP or IB reports will be received by the college, if you have your reports with you, that will help your advisor know where you would place in courses where like, like an AP score would let you get into the next level of a course. So having those available would be helpful. And if you've taken college courses, um, having a record of that so you can go over that with your advisor. They'll be able to see what you've sent us, but if there are things you haven't sent us, having those with you to go over with your advisor would be really, really smart and then be ready to review um, your list of questions. So I think that's what to think about when you're gonna meet with your summer advisor. Next slide. And I will turn it over to John, who is gonna talk a little bit about the curriculum. Hi, um, good afternoon and or evening um, and or morning, I guess. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Reed uh, degree and the parts of which it consists and sort of a sketch about the uh, what those parts are. Um, so, and it looks like maybe we skipped a slide. This is the one. Um, so a Reed major program consists of the general college distribution requirements, which are HUME 110 and the three group requirement areas. The major requirements, everybody has a, a major, um, and some of those are very straightforward. You will take the following list of classes. Some of them are very open-ended. You will take intro and six of the following 17 classes. Um, some majors uh, have associated concentrations that are required. Some majors have concentrations that are optional, and some majors have no concentrations at all. Um, so depending on which uh, major you end up deciding to pursue, and as Nora said, you'll have uh, definitely have some time before making any sort of decision on that front. Um, those are some of the finer points that you'll want to look at. Um, some majors, um, each of the departmental majors is broken up into an academic division, of which there are five. Um, those, in some cases, have divisional level requirements. If you uh, are in a major in one of the five divisions, the arts, history and social sciences, mathematical and natural sciences, uh, philosophy, religion, psychology and linguistics, and whichever one I skipped. Um, the arts, history and social sciences, and literature and languages, which is the one I skipped, have divisional requirements. The other two do not. Um, keep in mind, as Nora mentioned, PE is required. So you can do it anytime during your read career. Um, when we say you need six, what that PE is on a separate schedule from the rest of the academic universe. So uh, those classes change every quarter, i.e. there are four quarters a year rather than two semesters, which is the normal academic calendar. 
Um, so needing six means you need six quarters of PE with some limitations and some uh, open-endedness, but there are something like 50 or 60 PE courses to choose during a semester. So uh, there are quite a few choices available. Um, finally, the average is to get to 30 units by the time you complete four years, um, seven and a half units average per year will get you to the finish line. So if you only end up taking seven units your first year, don't worry about it too much. If you end up taking eight, then fine. Um, but you shouldn't feel like you have to push yourself when you're starting out. Adjustment to college is often sort of a challenging process for people. Um, the academic expectations are probably gonna be somewhat different than you had previously. And taking your time to get used to that is probably worthwhile. Okay, um, in addition, this is a discussion about the few comments about the distribution requirements, the humanities and the three groups. Each of these requirements uh, is a three unit requirement. Humanities 110 in and of itself is three units over the course of the year. The group one requirement, humanities and the arts, group two, history and social sciences, group three, natural, mathematical and psychological sciences. Each of those has uh, requires three units. Two units must be in a single discipline and one unit must be in another discipline. You can use courses in your major, you can use courses not in your major. Um, it's pretty open-ended in that regard. But when you're thinking about building your schedule of classes for a particular semester, if you know you're taking HUME 110, and perhaps you know that you're taking a course in your major, your third course should probably be something not in your major that's going to potentially apply to a different one of the distribution group requirements. Um, just a note on the uh, group three, the natural and mathematical sciences. Uh, one of those three units is required to be a class uh, specifically focused on data collection and analysis. And you can, uh, hopefully Martha will uh, mention that in her discussion about looking at the schedule of classes later on, but um, there are a way, there's a way to search for which classes apply to which distribution requirement. And so you can look at those. Here are some uh, sample majors, um, assuming someone is interested in anthropology as a major. Um, again, all students, first year students are required to take HUME 110. We recommend because anthropology has a foreign language requirement in it, in the major, that um, particularly if you don't have a background in foreign language, that that's a good course to take as a second class. And then, something in group three likely would be a, a, a reasonable choice um, or potentially something in the social sciences if that's uh, something else if there's something else there that you want to explore a little bit and then if you end up feeling like you want to add a class in spring the introductory anthropology class um, that has no prerequisites or um, and is open to first year students is offered in the spring. That might be a good time to consider adding that as a fourth class. Biology is slightly different. Um, the curriculum structure is more linear in the sense that 
you must take chemistry 101 before you can take chemistry 102 before you can take chemistry 201 um, there is those are the prerequisites that uh, norm mentioned previously if you're interested in one of those majors you should perhaps you you would have to take uh, spend a little more time thinking about what obligations you will have to meet when in order to progress in that major you may end up deciding that chemistry is for the birds and psychology is where it's at but if you don't then you can uh, get yourself into some pinches if you haven't started taking chemistry or physics or math early enough in your career um, again there's lots of flexibility in uh, when you take most of these things and there's very little is uh, impossible to recover from and if you end up deciding you know this whole sciences thing is i'm out of it and theater is where it's at and i'm starting everything with six semesters left to go um, that is something that people do. So don't worry about it if that's where you find yourself. Um, English majors, uh, something in literature and languages, um, a good, again, there's a division requirement for proficiency in a foreign language. Oh no, there isn't anymore, is there? Um, there is a requirement for literature not in your home department which may either be taken in translation or in the original language. If you want to pursue it in the original language, then you would need the appropriate level of language proficiency to take that. Most foreign literature classes require at least completion of second year. Some, uh, they want you to have taken a third year or introductory uh, literature class to, to uh, sign up for the more advanced courses. Um, and again, like as with anthropology, some English 200 level classes are open to new students in, you might consider adding one of those in the spring. For the most part, the English department likes it if you have had some experience in HUME 110, particularly with the expectations for paper writing and things along those lines. Um, finally, an art major, where there is a foreign language requirement in the division of the arts, um, you could consider HUME 110 a foreign language and uh, the first semester in the art history sequence. And then if you, uh, and then a class either applying to group two or group three, potentially in fall or spring, uh, depending on what's available. Um, try something different and get some uh, progress on the distribution requirements. And I think with that, I will turn it over to Martha to talk about scheduling. Hey there. So everyone got all that. <laughs> it was quite, quite a bit of detail, but really, I mean, it's all really helpful and, and it'll, it'll make more sense as you go along, I think. Um, so yes, down to the nitty gritty. Um, as Nora said, you probably had in high school kind of your, your classes were pretty much arranged for you, but now you have the pleasure and the pressure of finding open classes while considering your major and group requirements and balancing your time and being sure stuff doesn't overlap so you can get across campus. <laughs> so what you'll use is this tool. Um, you see a small screenshot of it, the schedule of classes. Um, there's a lot of good information on it. If you can read the slide, there's um, a number of drop down menus um, from subject, which is most obvious in order to find courses in, um, in a, any of our subjects, ranging from art to theater. Um, you probably won't be using the instructor tab this time. Uh, days and times will obviously help. 
And the one that uh, we wanted to point out is the one at the end, group requirements. Uh, we don't have a screenshot of this specifically, but when you drop, when you click that drop down menu, you'll see you can actually just say, what were those? And you could just ask for courses that meet in the fall that fulfill group two, and they will all be listed out for you. Um, the other tricky one is the group three, which is, we call it a three plus, and that, that is that um, data requirement. And that actually, you can search for that specifically. So when you guys, when this is done, you guys can open up a uh, schedule of classes and poke around and you'll be able to get a sense of, of all there is to offer. Uh, next slide, please. So what's a typical schedule look like? I just put this up so that you can keep in mind that things will start early. Um, we have a 745 PE class, I believe, on this particular schedule. So, and a, a nice big gap, don't forget to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. Um, and often classes will meet at different times. You might have a lecture that's on Wednesdays, but the lab is on Thursday afternoon or something like that. So that's just something to keep in mind that you're gonna be, you know, orchestrating your entire week. The next slide shows that some classes go as late as nine o'clock. So you do, there, we don't have a lot, but we do have some evening classes. Um, I think we have a number of PE classes that meet uh, in the evening. So uh, just again, be sure to, to reserve time for meals. And if you're getting a campus job, something else to think about is fit the job into your classes. Don't try to do it the other way around. So wait until you have your schedule and then pursue um, you know, campus work and that kind of thing, because that you're you know, student first. Um, okay, what's next slide? So once you've got all your schedule figured out and you, and you have a bunch of alternatives, um, use the solar pin that you receive from your advisor. So when you, when you meet with your advisor, we call it a pin, it's just personal identification number, um, you get one multiple times, but this will be your first and it will last you for the bulk of registration that starts in the summer and proceeds into um, the beginning of the term um, when, we, when we start in the fall. So that number is yours, it's unique. Once you use it, you'll be able to see it in IRIS, but be sure to write it down um, when you have this conversation. Um, only your advisor has access to it initially. Um, beginning Tuesday, July 6th, solar is open for day one. You also may hear us call it dibs day. Um, but it's, it's, we don't have, we have an interesting priority. Set. We don't give students priority within the group. We give everyone the opportunity to grab at least one class that they really want. So we call it dibs day or day one. Um, and that class is interpreted as just one part of the class. So one lecture, you know, one lab, um, for, for our continuing students, one PE class is sometimes their first, their dibs day class. Uh, but what we recommend is you choose a class that you're really excited about, um, choose the credit bearing part of that class, um, not just because we have some classes, some parts have credit, some are just zero credit because they are associated with the class. It's an additional section or additional lab. Um, and, uh, uh, Dibs day lasts for approximately 24 hours. Um, things will then open up the next day. So July 7th is when we'll have uh, registration for your remaining schedule. Um, and that remaining schedule, we recommend that is at that point you would add humanities and, and a second class um, for the fall. And then you have a Dibs day, not just for the fall, but also for the spring. So one class for each semester and then the rest of your um, year you can uh, register for. So let's see, did I say that right? Um, oh, wait list. Uh, that's going to definitely be part of the process. You'll uh, want to put yourself on a wait list. A lot of people will be changing their minds um, once the semester, um, as we go through the summer even, and, um, and once the semester begins. So we have a, a wait list system where you can click on, uh, you can add yourself to a wait list. I wouldn't use that for Dibs Day, um, but pr probably for the next day, you're gonna wanna do that. And 
um, as enrollments change, and if you uh, if there is a seat that opens up in a class that was that was full and that you put yourself on the wait list for, you would receive an email at your read email address, and you have 48 hours to add that class or that offer goes away. So that's something to just keep in mind is that you know you're if you uh, once once you're here and once you're uh, once you get started, once you get registered, um, keep an eye on your read email because that's where the notifications will come in. Uh, what's the next slide? Let's see. Ah, so the um, let's yeah, I want to figure it out. Uh, this is a sample screen of what to expect of solar. So you don't actually have access to that yet. But there is a link on the uh, new student website. There's a link on the uh, registrar's webpage. Um, you can access it once uh, once you have your PIN. Um, and as you can see, there's a, a drop down menu. This is showing the humanities, uh, a selection of humanities classes. The first Hume 110Y is the lecture, and um, the all of the other sections are listed in order, Y01, Y02, and there's probably gonna be like 25 sections of that. So you'll be able to find a section in humanities that will fit your other, uh, fit with your other classes. But there's the big green add button um, to, to add that class. Uh, let's see, what is next? Oh, and here's a sample of uh, a student schedule in solar. So this is again, just to get familiar with what it's gonna look like. Um, you can see it says fall 2021, um, where you can add courses. And on this, the student has already registered for a number of courses, humanities, math, and music. And you can see that there's a drop button. The red button is um, when, if they're gonna make some changes, that's where you can drop the class and then go back to the plus courses at the top in order to add a class in its place. Um, when you're in solar, you're going to see a lot of little pop-up messages too. We don't have a film of it here, but that you definitely want to read everything that comes across the screen. There's lots of good information. Um, so a lot of times it, it'll just remind you, oh, you've, you've, you're adding a lab, don't forget the lecture or vice versa. So, um, so just be sure to pay attention to all those little uh, notes that you see there. Uh, what's after the next slide? Oh, so this is just to show a very similar to what you saw before. Once you've got your schedule, once you've got your things, your uh, semester registered, you can see them separately. So this is either a fall or a spring semester. Um, these results are visible in solar, but they're also, they will be visible in IRIS, which is a uh, the more robust um, student information system that we use here at Reed. Uh, so it'll show you the days and times, locations. Um, if it's in person, I think we'd still have a few online classes. So um, that will all be, uh, that information will all be available um, on your class schedule. And the next slide. So just some things to keep in mind, um, registration details. Space is reserved for new students in many first year courses. So you should be able to find something of, you know, of interest, especially on day one. Um, remember, sign up for classes in fall and spring. We do have year long classes like our Humanities 110 takes put, continues from fall to spring. Um, and that one has a number of uh, conferences or, or sections and you're gonna wanna stay in the same section with the same faculty member. So that applies for languages and for the humanities. So if you're in section Y11 in fall, grab section Y11 in spring as well. Um, if by some chance there's uh, uh, that's full when you get to it, just put yourself on the wait list for it. These things usually will sort themselves out by the time the semester starts. And finally, some classes have multiple parts like the sciences. Um, and these parts need to be tied together. So be sure to, to take all the parts of that. Um, I think chemistry, I think we have an example of chemistry um, on the next page, on the next slide. Yeah. 
and multiple. So you can see the FL1, FL2 re refers to the lab. Um, the F32 um, re re refers to the conference. And then there's an additional lecture with that class. So, but there are classes such as um, psychology that don't do that. So don't be alarmed if you're taking psych, psych 101, you'll see that the lab and the lecture are actually, you register them just as one. So psych 101 section two has everything in it. And um, just make note that each section, they all, they all meet at different times, um, except for the lecture. So everyone attends the lecture and then the, the smaller sections break out from there, but you're not missing anything. Um, with that particular example. Uh, yeah. so that, okay, and then the last, my last slide is the next one. Okay, if your first choice is full, be sure you enroll in a second choice um, and then just watch for the wait list, as I mentioned, because sometimes it doesn't, uh, it doesn't move. And so that's, even though you put yourself on the wait list, it's not gonna come around. You know, think about it for next year. Um, but, uh, but be sure to, you know, I'm sure you'll find more than one, uh, a choice that you really want, um, explore different areas of interest. Um, nearly every course applies to group requirements, so you can't go wrong. If there is a field like sociology that maybe you weren't familiar with in high school, you know, that's something to think about, or, um, you know, it, it just think about areas maybe that you haven't explored and, um, and you'll, I'm sure you'll find something that'll, that'll be fulfilling. Uh, be sure to sign up for Hume 110 lecture and your conference. Um, Mention that. And if you think you've met the prerequisite, and this is important, but you can't register, like if you're getting an error message, that's when you contact us. We need to be sure that that kind of information is in the system. So um, uh, there's information at the end, but our general email is will be available to you to you when you start to register in July, and that's just registrar at read.edu, and we'll be able to help you out. Okay. Okay, we've been talking about PE because it's fun. Um, just just a, a quick um, review of that. Why PE matters at Read. Um, because it's great and there are a lot of choices. Um, you don't have to sweat, but you can. You don't have to compete, but you can. We do have some teams, team sports, um, ultimate frisbee, we have rugby, those kinds of things. You can learn to juggle from our math faculty. Um, archery still is our number one um, PE class, but I would say that when you see people out there with bows and arrows and targets, you should walk very, very far away because they're not good at it yet. So just be careful. Um, the reason it's in the curriculum is because sound mind, sound body. Um, they, we really believe Reed's a pretty, pretty academic place and people are working really hard. And so we wanna make sure people are taking care of themselves in all kinds of ways. And PE is one of the ways to do that. And then recently we've added a component where you could, of the six quarters of PE, three semesters, you could do two quarters or one semester of community engagement um, to fulfill the requirements. So there are a couple of paths to get there. Um, and John, the next slide. And the next slide gives you a couple of things. Martha talked about the schedule of classes and it also has some, when you see like an exclamation, a little red exclamation point, that means there's more information there for you to look at. And for example, rock climbing, which is one of our more popular courses, um, there's a fee. And so that's where you find it in the double secret um, um, red exclamation point. Um, and it also tells you, oh, wait a minute, this course, it might meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but there's a weekend expectation to weekends of the, of the term. So make sure you, you track those little exclamation points to see what the details are about, about a course. And that, that, that's also true in some of the other courses, but particularly in, in PE. So have a look at those. Um, in the past, when we've had students registering in person with us, they get so excited about all the choices that sometimes they spend 15 minutes thinking about PE. So think about that before you have your advising appointment and, and start to register. So that's it for the PE commercial. Next slide. Take it away, John.
And we're running low on time, John. So let's just, yeah. okay. Um, one of the things that many of you will uh, have is prior credit that's going to apply towards your college degree. Uh, for many people, this is going to be international baccalaureate classes. For many, it will be AP classes. For some, it will be uh, classes that you took at a college or a community college um, associated with your high school or just on your own. Um, and then there are some more exotic cases that uh, we occasionally see as well. Um, in general, um, we may not yet have received all of your scores from AP and IB, uh, in which case you will not see those credits being applied to your record. Um, this may cause difficulty in uh, working out the placement and prereqs um, in some subject areas. So uh, if, as Nora mentioned previously, if you do have copies of your scores, then that is worthwhile information to take to your advisor and use to speak with them about where it is you perhaps should be in terms of which math class or which physics class or what have you. Um, if you have not yet sent your uh, scores to read, please do so as soon as possible. Um, it generally takes a while for them to process things and get everything to us, and it will take us a while to get them evaluated and uh, the data entered. So the sooner that you request those, the better. In terms of transfer credit, um, which is prior college coursework, um, we do need an official transcript from the institution you attended. And um, typically we will get those evaluated and posted later in the summer than AP and IB credits. Uh, but again, it depends on when we get scores um, and or the complexity of how those courses uh, can be applied to your um, undergraduate major. Um, finally, keep in mind, um, if you have been very efficient in your uh, high school years, you can receive up to eight units maximum of AP credit, IB credit, college coursework combined for work done prior to your high school graduation. So in some cases, there are people who might be eligible for 12 AP credits, but you may only apply eight towards your degree. Um, the selection of which eight may be pertinent in terms of uh, where you need the appropriate placement for coursework that you're interested in pursuing at Reed. So if, if that um, becomes an issue, you can come into the registrar's office or send us an email and we can work with you to figure out what the best fit is in terms of credits to apply. And I think this was Jason's slide, perhaps? Yep. Um, so I'll, I'll move quickly or running short on time and I want to make sure, I'm sure that we get to some questions out there, but we do have a session scheduled a week from today, Friday, June 4th, same time. Uh, we'll talk about placement exams. Uh, you can see the timeline here. Just a quick thank you to John and to Martha and Nora. There's a lot of information, but a lot of good information. And a quick reminder to the students out there whose uh, heads are probably spinning a little bit that you will meet with your summer advisor before you register. So, so there's going to be another party involved here that's going to help guide you through this. But John, you can go to the next slide because there's some contact information here for folks in the registrar's office. Feel free to give us a buzz if you have any questions. And speaking of questions, Duncan? Yeah, we've absolutely got a few of them. Um, we have a couple quick ones that I'll start off with. 
Um, first off, how many classes do students have to be in to be considered full-time? So most classes are one unit, except Hume is 1.5 and a, some of them are 0.5 and a couple of them are 0.25, but three, three units, so generally three classes is gonna get them, that's the minimum full-time load. Awesome, thank you. And um, how about for transfer credit, do you also accept the international A-level exams? Yes. We do. Fantastic. Those okay. are one of the more complicated cases. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so they should contact you, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so a couple bigger questions. Um, num first off, uh, how, how much do you expect the schedule of classes will change over the summer? Is it set in stone now, or do you think there will be some slight shifts? There are always slight shifts. And I think um, right now, departments are looking at um, the size of the incoming class. They're looking at the enrollments of the continuing students, and they're already looking at adjustments to that. So, so there will be um, there will be some adjustment. And it's part of the reason we're gonna have students register for only three classes um, in July, and then we'll be able to do a little bit more fine tuning and open it up to four classes in, in August. Most first year students only take three classes. So the three classes should be, should be fine, but we will do some adjusting over it. So not set in stone, but, but pretty reliable. Okay, right on. Thanks, Nora. There's certainly a lot of stuff on there already. I've spent a little time looking around myself. Um, there's some great classes out there. Um, another question is, um, how easy is it to add spring classes in the fall? Um, or conversely, is it better for students to try and add all their classes in, over the summer to make sure that they get a seat? I think that strategic is to, and what we always ask students to do is think about the full year. But then once, and we'll close off spring when fall starts, but in November, we'll open it up again for them to make changes or um, let the wait lists process and all that sort of stuff. So, so I would say, give it a first shot, recognizing that you can change your mind. Okay, right on. Thank you. Um, Another question, uh, it's a little bit of advice. Um, how, do you, how do you all recommend that students space out their classes throughout the day, throughout the week? Um, should they focus on a couple different days and then save the other days for homework? Or what should they do? Well, I think that's a style thing. I mean, I think some people are morning people, some people are afternoon people. I think if I think for some people, if you leave the whole day empty, it's going to be really hard to say I'm going to be in the library all day. Um, you know, so I, I think it it depends on what students sense of how they how they regulate their own time. If somebody's a procrastinator, maybe having classes every day is a better idea. I don't know, John, Martha, Jason, what do you think? I think that's likely uh, likely correct is it's gonna depend on the individual a lot. Yeah. Um, most of the introductory classes tend toward more regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times a week is when the lecture meets. And then, you know, you're likely going to find yourself put into classes on most days. Um, you probably have some control over whether or not those you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays are particularly heavy, or Mondays and Wednesdays are particularly heavy. Um, but you will probably have classes every day, and that's probably a good thing starting out. Um, and um, you all do put a, a, a fair amount of thought into when the classes are scheduled and making sure things work out relatively evenly. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we only have so many rooms, so we have to distribute classes across the day and, and across the space. So it does really, it does sort of settle itself out that way. Totally. That, that said, as Nora mentioned, we're a small college and there are some classes of which there are exactly one section. And if that happens to be at the same time of the exactly one section of another class that you wanna take, 
There's not much we can do about it. Yeah. You're going to have to choose. Yeah, I, I would agree. Don't get too attached to like, this is my perfect schedule. I would definitely try <laughs> to go into this with a little bit more like, yeah, <laughs> take what comes. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. I think that's great advice. Um, another question is, um, what languages does Reed offer? Um, and can we count uh, credits from other sources as language credits? I suspect this might start bridging into placement exams as well, but I'll leave that question to you. So we would certainly accept transfer credit in other languages. If a student placed in another, um, placed in, an ex in a language we don't grant credit for, we wouldn't grant credit for say a placement test because we don't grant credit for our placement tests. But um, we have Chinese, Latin, Greek, French, German, Russian, Spanish, and Arabic. Do I have it? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And we and we probably could cover a little bit more of that in a placement exam day, but yeah, um, those are those are our languages. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is um, how, how what is the process behind students getting assigned their summer advisor and their academic advisors? So summer advisors we are going to assign um, around the middle of June and notify students shortly thereafter. And the academic advisors, Martha, is David looking at July, early July or mid-July? Yeah, I don't know his exact schedule. Yeah, but. so somewhere, yeah, somewhere closer, I'd say mid-July to be safe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it seemed like the answer to your question um, was more how? how does the matching occur? Oh, how? Oh, right. sorry, sorry. Yeah. And in, yeah. for summer advisors, there are a much more limited number of people doing the advising. So each advisor will have a large number of students to advise over this two or three week advising period. Um, and then you can continue to work with them uh, as time goes by and the registration system will still be open. So if you decide in, on August 1st that you wanna change something, you can go ahead and do that. Um, then any faculty member who are, is not a first year faculty member um, is a valid advisor for the normal academic advising. So instead of 30 of them, there will be 130. And each one will have many fewer advisees and those start out, um, I think Martha or Nora could speak to this more precisely, but prioritized by major, uh, undecided students kind of, we take our best guess based on what you've expressed your interests as being. Right. And, um, you know, but keep in mind that we're, we're not gonna put 40 students with a single advisor because they happen to be the only valid advisor in that major this year. Right. We, we talked about this on Monday, um, that it's really important to complete the advising questionnaire because those documents, the, there's two of them, one's letter to the advisor and an, and an advising questionnaire, will help us both with the summer assignment and ultimately with the um, academic advising assignment that will go into effect basically during orientation. Um, so yeah, we have, we're training the advisors to really have an, a great broad, um, ability to talk to students, um, since yeah, there'll, there will only be about, yeah, 30 of them. So for just for the summer, but those documents are really important. If you have any questions about them, you know, follow up because those are, those, sh they should be visible in, uh, on the new students website. Uh, you should be able to, to, it's part of getting started or whatever they're calling it. Um, and you should be able to complete those soon now <laughs> and so once the, the once students have been matched up with their advisors um the advisor will email the student right that's that's what we're we're suggesting to the advisors we're going to meet with them june 14th and we're going to say here's your list 
reach out to the students, you figure out how you want to do that, and um, and then the students will set an appointment with that advisor and have that conversation, get their PIN, and then be ready for registration um, July 6th. So that is the plan. Yep. Great. And we'll put updates um, certainly on our website and, and an orientation so people know what to expect and, and when we've gotten those assignments made. So people aren't freaking out that I haven't heard from anybody yet. Right. Um, we wanna make sure people know what to expect. And then the assignments that during the during orientation week, those will actually, those assignments will be arranged specifically. Right, um, right. You, you won't we'll have scheduled to Scheduled appointment time. Scheduled with... appointment times. And you'll be informed about what when that is, but hopefully right. you'll be here on campus and right. you'll get that information. Perfect, thank you. And um, moving on, um, someone is asking, uh, when, if you know, when will students be able to start looking for campus jobs and considering how they'll interact with their uh, classes? I don't know the answer to that question, but I would suggest that they register first <laughs> and figure out their jobs around their class schedule. Sometimes students try to do it the other way around and it becomes really difficult. So um, I don't know the answer about jobs. Martha, do you know? I don't, yeah, Mark might know, but he's not here. So um, they could certainly um, check who's this. There's a student work person that they could check Kate, with. Kate Walford. Kate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Handshake. Uh, Clubber might even have information about that. Life Beyond okay. Read, right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> right. So to sum up, those people that um, Martha just mentioned are the Center for Life Beyond Read. Um, which is the Career Services Office here on campus. Um, Kate Walford, um, who works in financial aid and is specifically the coordinator for all of student work here on campus, are um, some of the big people to reach out to about finding on-campus work. Um, I think certainly you'll start getting more and more information about that as soon as you arrive on campus. Um, let's see. Now we're getting to the ones I haven't read yet. Um, and we'll just ha probably have time for a couple more questions. And let me, while you're looking, if you just put in campus work on our website, it takes you to finding an on-campus job. And there's a, the next thing says, incoming students for fall 2021, check out the new students page. So campus work on the website, and you're gonna be able to get a good answer to that question. Perfect. Um, so a couple questions about um, AP tests. Um, number one, uh, when they send their score reports, are the ones that are the are the scores that are converted to credit chosen automatically, or did they get a chance to say, "I would like to use these scores"? We then, will. Go ahead. We will probably. So you can receive credit on AP scores in most subject areas on a four or a five. Um, Sometimes placement varies depending on which test it is and what your score was and things like that. So um, we'll evaluate them and take our best guess based on what you've said your major is and give you credit where we can. Um, that said, we may be wrong. If you end up needing, you know, your foreign and Spanish uh, AP credit more than you need your introductory econ micro AP credit, then we can trade them out um, and just uh, contact the registrar's office and we can work with you about making that alter alteration. If I hope, hopefully that's responsive. Perfect. And um, regarding like placing into classes, when do placement exams happen? And do scores on the language AP tests allow you to place into language classes or do you have to take that placement test? We want you to take the read placement exam. Um, I think it helps the advisor know kind of where you are with, with the AP exam, but our language folks really want you to take the, the exams. And those open on June 10th. And the best shot would be to take them between June 10th 
and I think they close on the 16th so that we can load those scores in so that advisors will have them when they meet with students. So there's a, I did put in the chat the, our AP guide of, of what, what um, exams yield which kinds of credit. Um, and you could also look on the web for the placement exam dates, but, but that'll be, um, if they do that, if students do that in June, that will really be helpful to get things ready for um, registration. Perfect. Okay, well, we're at five o'clock, everybody. Um, there were only one or two questions that we didn't get to, but if you have any questions, of course, you can reach out to all of these lovely people at registrar at read.edu, um, and they will be very happy to help you. I know there's, there was one question that was about who should I contact if I'm away during registration? Well, you should contact the registrar um, soon, even. Um, and so thanks once again to all of our presenters. Thanks to, for everybody, uh, to everybody for coming. Very glad to see your names and your faces. Um, and I hope you have a lovely holiday weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye, folks.